Hey, uh, we're going to wrap up our study of Aristotle today and indeed our course in ancient philosophy. Um, and so for one last time, I want to take you back to where we began with the second course of Sophocles Antigone, just to get you to think again about what the world of nature is like. Um, and the relevant point there is, remember from the second course, that the human being fits into nature kind of oddly. And I want you to have that issue in on your mind as we now turn to this issue of moral virtue in the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, because um, the, that, you know, we're, we're really studying here the distinctive human domain, and indeed we're, we're studying what it is to be a person. And to grasp that and that issue really requires thinking about that sense in which we don't quite fit so comfortably into the natural order of things. Why do I say that? Well, because if you think of just about anything else that would show up in the natural world, you know, your dog or your cat, your bird, whatever, um, those things uh, come with their basic ways of behaving. That's, you know, roughly what we call uh, instinct. But when we think about those things as forms of life, we're precisely thinking of things like, you know, the tiger is the thing that's going to uh, aggressively launch itself after the gazelle, or the dog is the thing that's going to chase cats. The basic forms of the behavior of any particular kind of animal are, are pretty much given. Um, the thing about a human being is that uh, who you are is uh, something you have to make for yourself. So for a human being, who you are is a matter of character, not so much a matter of nature. You know, what kind of person you are is the kind of character you've developed. And so human beings become someone. We, uh, the way we're going to be individuals responding to the world uh, is not given in advance, but it's something that is shaped through our actions over our lives. And, and that's, what, that's what he was talking about in Book 2, Chapter 1 when he was talking about habit and moral virtue is basically about that it's how you become habituated to being a certain kind of person like a cowardly one or an angry one or something like that uh, and so the, the thing is then remember he said you know how are these habits built so, so your, your character is a kind of habit it's the habit you have for for how you live how are habits built well habits are built from light like actions so if you be, you constantly re respond to things angrily, you'll develop an angry character, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the character you have, who you have become at the time you're old enough to read this book and think about these issues, the person you've become is, is a consequence of the things you did, right? Unlike other animals in the natural world, it's what you did that made you the kind of person you are. Now, initially you might think, oh, I'm really responsible for what a bad job I did. Um, but the, mo the further important thing to remember is that you were doing those things since you were, you know, one or less. Right? The, the you who was doing those actions that became your habitual way of behaving and that therefore became the you that is your established adult identity, uh, that you wasn't this you. That you was a little kid who hadn't yet developed the, the, the rich and complex world and the rich and complex powers that you have. So yeah, it's the actions you did that made yourself who you are now. But the you who was engaging in those actions wasn't this developed you. It was the radically undeveloped you who was just going through the process of being initiated into the world and learning how to do things, right? And so uh, so I'm going to remind you of the quotation with which uh, Aristotle ended Book 2, Chapter 1, where he said, uh, It makes no small difference then whether we form habits of one kind or of another from our very youth. It makes a great difference, or rather all the difference. Yeah, that's what I've just been explaining. But now, as he says in chapter 3, Hence we ought to have been brought up in a particular way from our very youth, as Plato says, 
so as both to delight in and be pained by the things that we ought, for this is the right education. Uh, that's at about 1104b11. Um, so, yeah, the things, it's the things you were doing since childhood that made you who you are. So in that sense, in, in, a, in a kind of um, direct causal sense, you are, you know, responsible for who you became. But, but in a moral sense, you're not particularly responsible. On the contrary, the people who are responsible are the ones whose job it was to educate you, the, job, the ones whose job it was to get you to practice the right kinds of actions so that you would be habituated to the, the right ways of responding to things. So that's why it makes all the difference what, uh, what you did as a kid. It makes all the difference what your upbringing was. Uh, because those things that were happening before you were there, the you you are now, before you as a self-reflective, um, thinking, you know, well-developed person were there to take charge and make decisions, all the decisions were already being made. They were being carried out by a little child, but they were being carried out under the guidance of, you know, the people bringing that child up, whose responsibility it was to get that child to practice the right things. And so if your parents cultivated in you practices that encouraged your sense of confidence, then uh, likely you're a confident and courageous person now as an adult. But if your parents encouraged in you an attitude of being fearful and timid in all kinds of situations, then likely you're a coward now right? because you develop the habit of responding to danger with fear. Or you develop the habit of resp responding to danger with confidence. You know, whichever one of those you developed, whichever one of those you practiced, you know, that's going to be what you became. But so that's the, that's the really powerful point he's making here. As, as I said, you know, this, this book, it's a book of ethics, but it's also a book about human nature. It's about what a human being is. And this is that, you know, you know, so he starts off by defining the human being as the being with logos. But now you can start to see the real point of that, right? The things in nature, they don't have to sit and take account of things. They can't, but they also don't have to because their uh, actions will be guided by instinct. Right? They're, they're, they're going to come uh, with a kind of orientation. The thing about the human being is we are the being that takes account, which also means we're the being that has to take account. So it's up to us to make the decisions about how we're going to live. It's up to parents to make the decisions about how they're going to raise a kid, etc., etc. But so it's not automatically given how you're going to respond to situations and so on. And because we're the being with Logos, who we become is in our own hands for better or for worse. Um, and so, you know, we're familiar with, with uh, referring to ourselves as free beings. Uh, and here you're sort of seeing what that really means. To, to, when, we, when we call ourselves free, what that really means is we are the animal with logos. We're a being who is part of the natural world, who participates in the natural world, but who does not have nature handing us a path. And consequently, it's up to us to use our own powers to shape how we're going to deal with the things that human beings confront. Right? And, f and for that reason, our, uh, going back to, to the book here, for that reason, our developed identities are going to be matters of character, which are going to be the sort of congealed history of the decisions we made about how to act. And those are mostly going to be decisions that were made by a person not really capable of making decisions. And in that sense, that child was channeling decisions made by those whose responsibility it was to direct that child well. And uh, you can probably tell by the habits of behavior you have at the age of 16 or 20 or 24 uh, how good a job your parents did at uh, encouraging you to practice the right kind of things. So what are some of those issues? Well, in Book 2, Chapter 7, he talks really about what the, what the states of character are we would really want for for us to, f to flourish in our humanity. We want to be courageous. We don't want to be cowardly. We want to be good-tempered. We don't want to be angry. We want to be able to 
moderate our, our pleasures. We want to be able to handle issues of pleasure and pain without just being the slave of pleasures and pains. Um, uh, so you can think about those things and you can ask yourself uh, how well that's working. Most of us, probably, um, certainly not all, but, but most of us would probably feel that we're doing okay with a lot of those things, but we probably mostly also, most of us also have some hang-ups, like maybe you are a person who just gets uncontrollably angry. Maybe you're an angry person. That's not your nature. That means you grew up uh, becoming habituated to respond angrily to situations. Um, but maybe you're angry, or uh, maybe you drink too much, uh, or maybe you're timid. Right? And so as, as adults, we actually can recognize these values and we can say, yeah, it's, that's what I'd like to be. And we can even try to be that. Uh, but it's not a matter of flipping a switch and saying, okay, now I'm going to be courageous. It's not like that because you have become habituated to this way of responding. And that's, that's those, those responses now are not things that come out of your reflective choice. They come out of the way you've basically learned to make sense of the world a way of making sense that's kind of embedded in your very body. And it says, so now you've, you have become habituated to experience situations that frighten you as ones that should be responded to in this way or that way, right? I mean, I just want you to think about what habits are like. When habits, you know, when it comes to tying my shoes, I can be talking to someone while I do it and I whip my fingers around and my shoelace is tied and I don't even know what movements I did, right? So, um, in fact, I had to try to teach my son how to tie shoelaces, and I could could barely figure it out, even though I can do it well enough, right? So, at a habit, when you when you have a habit, you you respond to situations without having to reflect on it, and the, the situation that confronts you just sort of calls forth a, a, a response from you or a reaction. Well, so that's what I'm getting at here when I say, you know, you may be habituated to having fear just call forth from your reaction, so you don't think of it as a choice. You think of it as what's called for. You just—it's just what you do in those situations, right? So that's—that's what—that's what a state of character is really like. It's—it's it's where you don't really experience yourself as doing something in responding that way. It's—you might say it's what comes naturally, almost. That's what it feels like. Or you might say like it's just what one does, or it's what the situation calls for. Right? When you when you are habituated to that way of responding. These don't seem like choices. They just seem like the way things are. But that's not the case. They are choices. They're choices that were embedded in your behavior through years of unreflective childhood behavior and so on. Um, so, uh, what, so what I was saying is that, you know, as adults, we probably find ourselves in that situation where we can sometimes say, well, I wish I weren't such an angry person. Or I wish I weren't so timid, uh, or whatever the opposite of that is, rash. I, I wish I showed more restraint in dealing with potentially dangerous situations and didn't just always rush in and think, oh, this is going to be cool, and then, you know, get in a lot of trouble. Um, so you can find that you have these ways of behaving, that you are someone that where you think, yeah, you know, that's not, it's not A+. Plus. Um, and then it's a challenge to change it. So I'm not going to read you the stuff about changing. And he, he talks about it a bit. He talks about it in book two, chapter nine. One of the things he says there is, you know, basically you got to rehabituate yourself. And the way to do that is you're going to have to practice doing kind of the opposite of what you do. So you might want to read that. Uh, also in book seven, which we're not going to read, um, he, he again talks about this, this situation that I'm saying most of us face, namely that we're probably doing all right, but we probably have some characteristics that we can recognize to be problematic. And we thus find ourselves wanting to act a certain way. And in fact, we act a different way. And book seven is largely sort of analyzing that and trying to figure out what's happening there. Those are places you can look in the Nick McKean ethics if you want to pursue that idea. But what I want to pursue here in, in book two is really just the idea of what good action would be, what good character would be. So I've tried you know, just to conjure up for you a sense of character, what it means for us to have developed a certain character, and uh, and to try to draw attention to some ways that we might easily recognize bad habits or problems of character. 
Um, so what would it be to, to, have, to have good character? Uh, and that's to have good character with respect to these issues like, you know, anger, fear, uh, pleasure and pain and so on. Um, good character means basically responding to situations appropriately. That's a helpful word to remember. What do we mean by appropriately? Well, we mean, you know, in a way that, you know, a person who takes account of things well would recognize to be proper to the situation. Some situations don't warrant a lot of fear. You know, it, it, as you're walking out on the street, I guess it always could happen that, um, you know, a meteor or something might come through space and a little bit of it might pass through the atmosphere and a little bit of, you know, red hot rock traveling at really high speed might hit you in the head and uh, put a hole through you and kill you or maybe just cause severe brain damage. Who knows what, you know, it could happen. But if that possibility made you terrified of going out in the street, you'd say, yeah, that's, that's not really a good assessment of the situation. On the other hand, if out in the street in front of you right now, uh, a war is going on and people are shooting, you know, snipers are shooting automatic rifles out of a window at other people on the ground who have automatic rifles and hand grenades are going off. And you think, oh, I'm kind of hungry. I think I should go buy a bag of potato chips. And you look out and you think, oh, I'm not scared of those people. And you walk out like, then we think you're rash, right? That's a situation where it would be a really bad assessment not to recognize that the level of danger there is so is sufficiently high to uh, to require that you stay away from that. Right? So I'm trying to pick out a couple of pretty extreme situations to show how uh, a response can be a real mismatch, right? If you're afraid of that meteor, that's not really an, an assessment of the situation. That's a reflection of you and how incredibly timid you are. And in the situation of the gunfire, um, you're not really assessing that situation when you say, oh, um, it's, it's cool out there for me to go buy my potato chips. No, that, that, that's not a reflection of the situation. That's a reflection of you. Like you're just a rash person who pointedly doesn't take account of the situation in deciding how to act. Right? So there, th those kinds of reactions being, you know, and others are extreme ones, but being, you know, really rash or really cowardly here, what those things reflect is precisely not the reality of the situation, but you. Right? Whereas a good assessment, we could roughly say, is objective. Um, good, good assessment means being good at realistically taking account of what the situation actually is and what it calls for. Uh, now, you could maybe you can do that intellectually. In my examples here, I just talked about a couple of situations, and you could think, oh, yeah, you'd be crazy to go out in that gunfire, or you'd be crazy to be afraid of the meteor. Um, you might be able to think about those things intellectually. The thing about character is it's not about what you as a reflective agent can conjure up explicitly on some occasion. The thing about character, as I was saying before, is it's who you are as an agent. And so... Good character means being the kind of person whose way of immediately responding to a situation affectively, you know, and how you feel and behaviorally, right, in, in terms of how you're, how, how you're drawn to respond. Um, good character is uh, m having that, that good manner of assessment kind of built into your affective and behavioral response. Right? And so that's what moral virtue was about, remember. It was having those aspects of your soul, of who you are, that are not themselves the power of taking account. It's about having those things well persuaded by your taking account. So it's your affect, your feelings, and your automatic forms of behaving, you want those things to have been persuaded by reason so that the way you're inclined to act, the way you feel about things, is the way a good assessor feels about things, the way a good assessor is inclined to act. So that your, in other words, your immediate response to a situation uh, reflects 
Logos reflects a good taking account, even though it is not a matter of explicitly thinking through the situation and figuring things out. So a courageous person is the person who has cultivated a, a sort of healthy and uh, intelligent responsiveness to situations of danger, presumably as a child, such that by the time you're 20, you the way you're inclined to act is, is basically the right way, the way that's appropriate for the objective conditions of situations. Uh, um, that's what that's what good character would be and that situation of responding neither from an overblown uh, uh, retreat in timidity or an overblown uh, launching yourself out into things in rashness here I'm talking about the situation of danger right uh, that situation of of not being wildly on one side or another he calls the mean what he really means by that is you have a kind of reaction that um, is is proportioned or is, is appropriate to the situation. And that reaction is going to be, sticking with danger, it's going to be somewhere on the scale of retreat or advance. Uh, so it's not going to, you're not going to respond out of always retreating from any danger. You're not going to respond out of always advancing in any danger, which would be cowardice and rashness, respectively. You're going to uh, you're going to respond sometimes by advancing, sometimes by retreating, depending on what the situation calls for. And so in that sense, your response is going to be somewhere in the middle between an excess of always responding or an ex uh, re advancing or an excess of always retreating. But it's not a middle in the sense of being a mathematical midpoint. It's not in the middle of saying uh, uh, always do X. Right? Is if, if it were an always do X, well, then you wouldn't be responding to a situation. You'd have a rule that you're following, but you wouldn't actually be feeling, feeling, the, feeling the situation, feeling what it calls for. Uh, so he says that at one point. He says, you know, when you're thinking about what, what, you know, what, do you, what do I mean by acting from the mean? Or what do I mean by acting from the appropriate kind of responsiveness? Uh, he says, uh, this is in chapter 2. This is at uh, 104a, about 7. He says, the agents themselves must in each case consider what is appropriate to the occasion, as happens also in the art of medicine or of navigation. Right? So this is in the context where he's saying, you know, if you want, if, if you want someone to tell you how to act well, it's not a matter of coming up with an exact rule, always do this. The answer is, a a respond in a way that's appropriate to the situation. But but to say appro appropriate, that's not non-rigorous, it's not vague. It's the most rigorous thing. It, it's saying you always have to be, in the sense I was using the word objective, but the point about that is that the objective response to situations means being attuned to the unique needs of that situation it's about this situation and you don't have rules about this is you have rules about universal types of things if you're relying on a universal rule if you're treating things as just an instance of a type you're not treating it as this uh, unique singular event aristotle actually says about that in the passage that i read he says uh, the agents themselves must in each case consider what is appropriate to the occasion. And what, what he's really saying there is you have to respond to the opportune moment, the kairos. Uh, and that was actually the same word that Socrates used back in Book Two of the Republic when he was saying what it is to uh, really possess an art. It's knowing how to do the right thing when the, when the moment is right, to strike at the right moment. And that's kind of what he's saying here. The, the person who assesses a situation well uh, in in practice, in that sort of behavioral way, is a person who can see what it calls for, and that's that matter of unique responsiveness to it, and you know what what it opens up. So so I think you can see there the real difference between essentially what what a good a good habit and a bad habit is. Right, a good habit 
is very intelligent. A good habit is um, a way of behaving that kind of has good assessment built into it. And that's why I've been using the word response. It's responsive to a situation. Right? It, whereas bad habits, I would be more inclined to call reactive. And by that, I mean, it's already decided what kind of thing you're going to do, right? The, the occasion, the, the situation just triggers that. Danger, run away. Um, pleasure, get it. Uh, and things like that. So it's a reaction. It's a reaction in the sense that uh, it's automatic, almost at the level of you know, if then, right? Rather than being a matter of meaningfully grasping the unique meaning of this situation, and that's why you know Aristotle was saying moral situations are never going to give you rules. There, there are going to be situations that precisely call for you to judge well the unique demands of this. And that's what you need to have cultivated in your character. Uh, and on that point, I want to read you one more passage. This is from uh, chapter six. Uh, and he's again talking about what it means to really respond excellently and to respond out of the mean. And this is around 1106b20. He says the issue is to feel them, whatever feelings we're talking about, to feel them at the right times with reference to the right objects towards the right people with the right motive and in the right way. That's what's intermediate and best, and that is the character of virtue. Right? So that, and that is precisely this point I'm making about something that is the opposite of a rule or a reaction, but is uh, responsive to what is called for with respect to time and place and person and action, right? All of these things is doing the right thing in the right time at the right way with the right people and so on. Uh, and in that sense, always answering to what is right in this situation, which you can't really specify in advance. And so uh, I really want to make only one more point about this. Uh, and that is uh, from the beginning of chapter three of book two. Uh, he says there, we must take as a sign of states of character the pleasure or pain that ensues on acts. So there, I want you to think about this, that um, people don't feel pleasures and pains the same as each other. Our, our pleasures don't just automatically follow on certain situations. That they, what we take pleasure in is itself a matter of habituation and character. When when you become habituated to something, uh, commonly, your sense of pleasure shifts with that sense of habituation. So something, the, the thing you're going to become habituated to often is initially hard, like tying your shoes when you're a little child. It's really hard. You don't want to do it. Um, but as you practice it and get good at it, it can become the case that you like it. As that movement gets smooth, you know, you like to do it. Uh, exercising is an example of that. Uh, often people have, feel like they have to start exercising because they're overweight and unhealthy and think, oh man, I gotta fix my life. Um, and so they start exercising and it's hard. Oh, it's hard to get yourself to go to the gym. It's hard to run, lift weights, whatever it is that you're doing. But if people stick to it by repeating the same acts, they become habituated to it. They then become the kind of person who exercises. And at a certain point, people start to take pleasure in it. They look forward to going to the gym. They start to like the feelings they get from the exercising and so on. Uh, the very thing that formerly was a matter of pain and unpleasure now becomes a matter of pleasure. So the things that we become habituated to are the things that we take pleasure in by and large. And so that's why pleasure and pain are a kind of signal of states of character. Uh, and he, he says in there, you know, the, the some people, you know, when when having to face a dangerous situation, will really find that unpleasant. And that's not really true of the courageous person, because for the courageous person, pre presumably, you know, it's it's just a matter of doing the normal thing that situations call for. And it's it would be it, it might be neither pleasant nor unpleasant, or it might straightforwardly be pleasant to enter into that situation with its demands. Uh, for a person who is also quite confident of being able to deal with what's going to come up, you know, 
So, you know, you might think, oh, it's going to be so unpleasant to do that. Well, it's not that it's inherently unpleasant. It's that you are habituated to feeling displeasure in relationship to that. Right. So that's another one of these situations where the thing that you treat as as if it were just the quality sort of coming from or called for by the world is actually really a reflection of you. It's actually in that sense subjective. And our pleasures change with our habituation. And so as he said, the things that we take pleasure in largely reflect our character. Uh, some people think, oh, I want dessert, I want dessert, I want dessert. Other people don't look on dessert as so inherently desirable and pleasurable. Um, it's not so much because of a different natural makeup as because of a different way of being habituated to the importance of, you know, entertainments and, and sensory pleasures in everyday life. And, you know, some people don't want that because they've been habituated to something else. Uh, so I just want to, to make that, to, to draw on that remark because, as he also said, here's one of the reasons it's so hard to change habits. Uh, he says one of the hardest things to fight against is pleasure. Pleasure is very alluring. Uh, and so if you have a bad habit, following that bad habit is going to feel to you like the right thing to do. And it's going to feel really unpleasant to do the opposite. Um, and so if you want to break the habit, you're going to have to do things that feel unpleasant. And you might even think, oh, this must be wrong because it feels unpleasant. When in fact, of course, it's going to feel unpleasant since you're trying to change your very sense of what you take pleasure in. Um, but so, so, the, so to really, to grasp then the things that Aristotle is saying here, you need to reflect on the nature of habit and think about what that process of habituation is, right? Where you take something that initially is kind of foreign and difficult, and just by spending time with it and becoming familiar with it, the difficulty starts to go away. It starts to get easy. The foreignness goes away. It starts to become familiar. And the displeasure associated with doing it actually starts to turn into pleasure. And as you then become habituated to it, it becomes something you no longer even reflect on. It just becomes how you do things. right? So as I said, you've got to think about that as just the general process of habit in general. And now think, OK, how did you become who you are? You became who you are by becoming habituated by exactly that kind of process to ways of dealing with certain types of situation. What are the types we're talking about? What are the big types? Things that, that, are, that are matters of uh, anger. So, we, so irritations and frustrations, to pleasures and pains, to dangers, to matters of shame and pride. You know, and he, he lists quite a few of them in, in uh, chapter 7. You get a list of the, you know, about 10... Uh, domains of character and so he sort of talks about like what what do we call a the, the virtuous way of responding to that uh, well so who you are is how you built habits of dealing with those things and those habits have made it the case now that it just seems to you like certain things are the right way to behave and you don't even recognize that those are those are your history shaping your perception. So you see things the way you do, and I say see things, what I mean is you feel about certain situations and behave in response to them in the ways you do because of the habits you built of, of doing exactly that over many years. And in that sense, you're responsible for who you are. But as I said before, that, that you that's responsible for it was a little kid who, who can't be held responsible, right? In, in, on the contrary, the, you did those things because that's what the people who were responsible for getting you to right, do the right things got you to do. Um, and so now, as a grown-up, you know, it's great if you have good habits and you can say, hey, thanks, mom and dad, uh, or you know, whoever it was who raised you. Um, you can be very grateful for uh, that very helpful upbringing. Uh, if you have bad habits, uh, you can complain about your upbringing or you could, you know, put that issue aside and just recognize, well, I'm going to have to change these habits. I mean, it might be important to understand that issue of upbringing because then you will come to see how and why you developed the ways of behaving that you did. But the issue is going to be, uh, can I can I change those things? Um, uh, 
uh, anyway, but that's so that's 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 in a way the the conclusion of this story about human nature. That the human being is the is that animal, that part of nature, who, for better and for worse, takes account of things. For that reason, we can do all kinds of things that apparently nothing else can do. Like we can do science. We can figure out all kinds of stuff about the world. We can build all kinds of great stuff, right? That's the better part, I guess. The worst part is it's not naturally given how we're going to develop in our basic ways of conducting ourselves in response to the kinds of situations we need to be able to deal with. That it's up to us to figure that out for ourselves, right? We're people of character in that sense. And so... We're highly dependent dependent on our own logos, but even more important, we're highly dependent on the logos of those people who are responsible for us, like our parents. And in fact, and, and I'm going to add one final sentence or one final thought, and this is going back to Book Two, Chapter One, uh, when he's talking about habits and good behavior and so on. And that you know, I was saying, you know, that we're dependent on logos. So most immediately, you're dependent on your own logos. But that's not going to do you very well when you're a kid, because when you're a kid, you, don't, you haven't learned how to take account of things yet. So you're going to be dependent on the logos of your parents. Right? Well, and beyond that, he says, uh, Book 2, Chapter 1, uh, 1103b, around line 3, he says, This is confirmed by what happens in states, for legislators make the citizens good by forming habits in them. And this is the wish of every, legislat uh, every legislator. And those who do not affect it miss their mark. And it is in this that a good constitution differs from a bad one. Right? I mean, so that, that last point, is, is, and this is a way then to think more about humanity and about the political dimension of humanity in particular, uh, that's what laws are about. And that's what institutions are about. They're about setting up the things that are going to guide us in our behavior so that we become habituated to responding in an appropriate way to the demands of the world. So yeah, you're going to count, you have to count, you need to count on your parents' logos to be better than yours when you're two years old. Um, and sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't. Um, but you also don't want it just to be, we as human beings don't want it just to be the case that we're dependent on a couple of people to know how to do things. And that's in a way what civilization has been about, right? It is the establishing of the the kind of guide to good behavior that's going to encourage us in the right kinds of actions, right? So, so yeah, there's a kind of logos at work there, but it's the logos that's embedded in the history of humanity that is now sort of congealed in the laws and institutions that shape our culture. Uh, so, so as I said, this more or less then completes our story about humanity and focusing on that specific way that we are part of nature but seemingly different from everything else in nature for this particular reason and then here we've just been trying to open up um, some of the consequences of that some of the ways in which that makes the issues of human life which are which are different than the issues any other creature faces and which are everything for us and for our lives uh, so there are lots of places you could go from there uh, you could go further into the Nicomachean Ethics, you know, books three and four really get into the specific virtues. Um, book five is about justice. Uh, book six looks at intellectual virtues. Book seven looks at this situation we're in of typically having some bad habits. And, and so then the kind of tension we feel between the kind of person we want to be and the kind of person we are and how we deal with that. Uh, books eight and nine are, you know, a really... Um, rich and interesting look at the nature of friendship and its role in a healthy and fulfilled human life. Um, and, and book 10 has a variety of things in it, uh, but inc including a kind of sort of looking back and saying, so, you know, where, where does this really leave us? Um, uh, and so, you know, you can go on to any of those things from this remark that I was just reading in book two, chapter one about law, you could go into Aristotle's politics, or indeed, I would hope that it might actually make a little link to you right back to the Republic and the things we were studying there. Uh, anyway, there are lots of uh, directions you can go from here, but what I've tried to do in these four lectures is uh, really give you Aristotle's basic understanding of what we are, who we are. You know, starting from the from the definition of nature in Book Two, Chapter One of the Physics, and going through to understanding 
exactly what we are in relationship to this and how and why that analysis leads us to understand the distinctive human condition, you might say, the things that we as human beings face. Um, so, uh, so I hope that uh, I hope that made sense to you.